Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. Now here comes the first trick, and that is Parallel Axis Theorem. Now whenever you see theorem, you have bad flashbacks to math, but this one's actually pretty simple. Parallel Axis Theorem says, okay, if we know the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis, we can actually very quickly determine the moment of inertia about a different axis. Remember we said in our formulas here that the moment of inertia, the actual value that we calculate, is dependent on where that axis is. So if we have a rectangle, again, we found ix as base times height cubed divided by 12, but this is only if our x-axis passes through the centroid of our rectangle. And you're saying, okay, well, what exactly does this mean? Well, it means that if the prof wants to be mean on the exam, they're going to say, okay, you know it about the x-axis that passes through the centroid, but what happens if I want the moment of inertia about this axis x prime? Now, if you don't know parallel axis theorem, you're going to have to go integrate. No one wants to integrate, let's be honest. But if I wanted to, I could easily find the moment of inertia through the integration method. I can take a horizontal slice, I can do my integral, and I can get that it's actually base times height cubed divided by 3. So again, notice that depending on where the axis is, the moment of inertia is actually going to change. This one, as we can see, if I were to take my axis as the bottom of the shape, my moment of inertia increases because, again, I have a lot more area farther away from my axis, if that makes sense. But this is the trick. This is the goal of parallel axis theorem. You're saying, Clayton, I don't want to integrate. Integrating sucks. Well, parallel axis theorem basically says that if we know the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis, which we do, base times height cubed divided by 12, then we can easily determine the mo moment of inertia about any parallel axis. Well, you're saying, okay, how do we do that? Well, it's simple. The formula is the moment of inertia about any parallel axis is going to be equal to the moment of inertia of the centroidal axis plus a times d squared. Now you're saying, okay, well, what is a, what is d? Well, a is the area of our shape. So if we look here, if we have a rectangle, it's base times height. And d is actually going to be the distance between the two axes. So if we were to apply this to the example above using parallel axis theorem, we can say, okay, the moment of inertia about x prime, again, the one that we want, is going to be the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis, which we have right above base times height cubed divided by 12 plus a times d squared. Well, we already said that a is going to be base times height. And again, it's just the area of the rectangle. And this d is going to be the distance between the two axes. So if the centroid is located at h over 2, we know that d is going to be h over 2. So if we were to substitute all this in, we actually arrive at the exact same answer, base times height cubed divided by 3. But the key thing here is we didn't need any sort of integration. How sexy is that? So this is why parallel axis theorem is so nice. Now between us, this is what typically happens on exam type scenarios. Typically, and I don't want to say typically because I know for the U of A this is true, but I don't know wherever else you're from. We as instructors will give students the moment of inertia about the centroid of simple shapes. So a square, a rectangle, triangle, a circle, and then what we'll typically do is we'll ask for the moment of inertia about a different axis. Now the thing is, if students don't know about parallel axis theorem, it's going to suck. It's going to suck a lot. But now we, if we look at parallel axis theorem, if we know the area and distance between those two axes, and we're given the moment of inertia about the centroidal axes, it actually makes calculations a lot easier. We are going to do an example of this later on in the lecture video. Some of you students, that's going to say, hey, how exactly is this true? Can you show a proof? Well, of course I can show a proof. We can actually prove parallel axis theorem by considering a simple scenario. And that is this. Let's say that we have a random shape, and this was about as random as I can get in PowerPoint. Kind of looks like a deformed Pac-Man or something like that. And let's say that it has a centroidal axis, x prime, and we want the moment of inertia about a parallel axis, x. Well, we know, for instance, that the formula for the moment of inertia is going to be the integral of y squiggle squared dA 
So if we were to look at this, and we know that y squiggle is basically the distance from the axis we want, in this case the purple axis, to our element, we know that we can expand this to d plus y prime squared dA. From there, since I have something squared, I'm going to expand it as follows. So we have y prime squared plus d squared plus 2 times dy. And then from there, I'm going to separate it basically into three integrals, which I'm going to call 1, 2, and 3. Now, if we were to look at these integrals, the first one's pretty simple. It's the integral of y prime squared with respect to dA. So basically, the distance from our centroidal axis to our element squared dA. Well, hold on one second. This is just the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. So this would be the moment of inertia with respect to x prime, the red axis. If we were to look at the second one, we have the integral of d squared times dA. And remember that d, the distance from our axes, well, that's just a constant. So I can actually factor that outside of the integral, where I get d squared times the integral of dA. And we know that the integral of dA is simply just going to be area. So that one's also not too bad. The one that starts to trick students up if they're ever trying to do this proof is this third one, where we have the integral of 2 dy prime dA. Remember, d is constant. We can take that out. But y prime is not constant. So that's something that we have to be aware of. So we can simplify our integral into 2d times the integral of y prime dA. And if you remember back from centroids, this is essentially saying 2d times the moment about the centroid. Now it's not exactly equal to moment, but this is going to be the best way I can explain this to you. If we were to look at our centroidal axis, we know that at this point everything should bounce, meaning that all the moments on the left side are going to cancel with the moments on the right side. So because of this term, this is actually going to be equal to zero because the concept that is at the centroid, everything actually balances, all right? I, I feel like that Thanos meme is going to come up, but you know what I'm saying. Everything balances. So the summation here should actually be equal to zero. And if this is the case, well, we know that the moment of inertia about the x-axis is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis plus a times d squared. Now this is very important. I want you all to remember this. This term right here will always be the moment of inertia of the centroidal axis. And the reason why is this. If we were to look at that third term there, that integral, where we said because it balances, it's equal to zero. Well, if we were to take the moment of inertia at some other spot, we're going to have a scenario where it doesn't balance. So that third part right there would actually be non-zero. So it's something to be aware of. This formula only works because we're taking the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. Now you're saying, Clayton, what can I do with parallel axis theorem? Well, there's going to be a bunch of things. The first one is it actually allows us to solve for the moment of inertia for other simple shapes that we normally couldn't really do using the integration method. The best example would be a right triangle. If I were to look at the centroidal axis, which we have displayed here, and we say, okay, if I want the moment of inertia about the x-axis, it's going to require horizontal slice, just like before. Well, you can immediately run into problems because it's very difficult to define the actual base of this slice. It becomes quite difficult. It's not impossible, of course, as you math nerds know, but it does become very difficult. So rather than actually going from the integration method directly into the centroidal axis, Let's consider a different scenario where I want to calculate the moment of inertia about this axis right here. Again, this one's not the centroidal axis, but in this configuration, our life is actually a lot easier because I can define my horizontal slice as follows and say, okay, if my horizontal slice is here, then we know that y squiggle is just going to be equal to y. And if I were to look at the slice itself, we know that it's going to have a thickness dy and it's going to have uh, the base as a function of y, which is going to be b minus b over h times y. Now, the first thing I'm going to get mentioned a lot is, hey, Clayton, how exactly did you get that? Well, keep in mind that triangles are just linear lines. So all I did was take y equals mx plus b, and then I rearranged for x. So it's not too bad. Now that I know both the base and the height of this slice, I can find the area as simply base times height. And then from there, I can go into my moment of inertia formula, where it's the integral of y squiggle squared dA. 
I know what DA is, as well as Y squiggle, so I can substitute everything in, and I get base times height cubed divided by 12. It's actually the same as a rectangle, believe it or not, uh, for this particular case. Now, this is nice because I can take what I've learned on the parallel axis side, and now I can come back to my centroidal axis side and actually calculate the moment of inertia about the centroidal axis. If we look at parallel axis theorem, we know that ix is equal to i bar x plus a times d squared. Again, I want to find the moment of inertia about my centroidal axis, which is going to be this term right here. So in order to do that, I'm going to rearrange the formula where ix bar is equal to ix minus a times d squared. And if we were to look at this, we actually know what everything is. The first one is we need the moment of inertia about any axis. Well, if we look on the right hand side, we found the moment of inertia about the axis that is parallel to the base of the triangle. We have that as base times height cubed divided by 12. We need to know the area of the shape next, but that's just going to be one half base times height. And then the last thing we need to know is D, the distance between the two axes. And we know that for a triangle, the distance between the base and the centroid is going to be h over 3. So everything is lining up quite nicely. We can substitute everything into this formula, and we get base times height cubed divided by 36. And if we were to repeat this same process for the y-axis, we can conclude that the moment of inertia for our right triangle is going to be base times height cubed divided by 36 for the x-axis, or height times base cubed divided by 36 for the y-axis. So yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video.